Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was nice. I'm going to start out this morning with, with a real big praise. My granddaughter has a um, very sweet uh, best friend that was in her wedding a couple years ago. And she just had a little boy. His name is Waylon, a very cute little thing. But little Waylon was born with tuberous sclerosis. It is a rare multi-system genetic disease that causes non-cancerous benign tumors to grow on the brain and other vital organs. Well, they found this out before he was born. When he was still in mom's tummy, they found this out. So this, this, these, these young ladies at this church are so strong in their faith. They all got together and laid hands on their best friend. And they have been praying for her and praying for her. Well, Waylon is born. He's just an adorable little fella. And they've been doing some tests and stuff. He does have some of the tumors on his brain. He's got, so they found out he had some on his eyes and some on his heart. But the ones on his eyes are not affecting his vision. They're around his eyes. And the ones on his heart are shrinking. So we know God can heal and will heal. So let's keep this little boy wailing in your prayers. But I had to start the morning out with such a wonderful praise that God is in the healing business, and these girls know it so tight, and they're pressing it out to their girlfriends and guy friends and husbands and kids that they have daycare with and stuff. So this is another story that you can go out and tell other people. God is in the healing business in our hearts, number one. But he also heals physically. So let's keep that in our minds this morning. Let's get up this morning. Let's praise the Lord with a song. And let's start out with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we're able to come in this coffee house and turn it into a church. And the Holy Spirit is here with us now. We ask you hear our praises and our prayers Do you answer them in your own time and we sing to your glory this morning we ask that you pastor allen's words touch someone here or online somewhere to open their heart up to jesus so he can come in and change their lives all these things we ask in jesus precious and holy name amen
What a place we've got to go. We've got him. We can lean in on him for every issue, every problem, every praise, every exciting thing that's happening in your life. Don't just go to God and say, oh, Lord, I'm having a rough day today. Thank you, Lord, for I'm having a great day today. Every day there's something, something in our lives, something we see. And make sure you tell that next person, I love you, because they may not hear it from somebody else. <laughs> That's something we can do, show God through our lives. So I want to get some prayer and praises. Now, I already gave one praise. I want to hear some more prayer requests and praises this morning. Anybody? Yes, sir. Praise Jump on the wagon. My family, my sister, actually, she's my niece, gave birth this morning to a baby boy. Congrats. Wow. Richard Camello. So he's a New York family, and we're very excited for him. He's joining Big Brother Coleman. All yeah. right. Congratulations, Eric. Woo! New baby in the family. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Yes, ma'am. Uh, praise. Um, my cousin lives in Alabama. Um, she just had a baby. Um, Preeclampsia for her first pregnancy, she had preeclampsia and had baby early this time. There was no complications. Um, the name is very special. Her older brother passed away years before I was born, and she named her baby boy after him. Oh, that's awesome. So we have a new baby in Alabama. Is that where you said it was? New baby born, and mom was doing well. First pregnancy was rough, but this little man came into the world, so we're excited. Listen to all these praises, new babies. I love it. Keep praying for Tom. Yes. And make us full recovery. Absolutely. I did get two names from Rich um, this morning. Mary Ann Madonna. She is uh, suffering with pan pancreatic cancer. So let's keep her in our prayers. God's in the healing business. What did I tell you this morning? Also, Loretta Pazinski. I believe that's the right way to say it. She has colon cancer. So let's keep her in our prayers also. God can do it. We've got so many praises here in this church that we know God has healed people. Not just because what the doctor says, yeah, it came out okay. We know God did it. Yes, ma'am. Praise God. He will heal you. That's right. Um, he will heal you. Thank progress so far has been very good with pre-op stuff going on. And God blessed us with a really good doctor. And Hank's got great faith that all this is going to work out. And we're praying for Hank. We know it. We know it. Now, when is his surgery? 27th. 27th. All right. We got that on our list. We're going to say extra prayers on that day, but definitely. Any more? Valerie, yes, I'd like to ask a prayer. My, my grandson, Jordan, is in Prague, and he will be there probably five months. All right. Jordan is in Prague with some of his NC State. Protecting folks, so we're going to keep them in our prayers. You sent me some pictures, and I told it, I, I texted him. I said it looks sort of rainy and dreary there. <laughs> so I think their uh, weather is a lot like ours. Oh, I got you. Ours their winter. We'll definitely keep them in our prayers. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here today in your house today. We thank you for this day that we can draw close to you, Father. Oh, Lord, there's so many wandering around out there and wandering around in confusion and craziness and hurried and busy lives, and they just don't know the power of prayer and, and the power and how much you love them. You created them. They woke up alive today, God. Each one of us in here today, God, we are blessed just for coming to hear your word read to us. Your word said we would. We would be, and we believe it. Father, all these prayer requests, Lord, you know everything, even the unsung ones, the ones that are hidden in people's hearts. You know us down to our DNA. Father, we ask you to touch them, and if it be your will, Lord, heal them. And sometimes, God, we understand that our healing is not of this world. You understand, God. We don't understand your mind, but we do have the mind of Christ. And, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for his love and for him coming to this world and dying for us, giving us hope, giving us a reason to pray, Lord, a reason to get up and to get out there and, and go every day. We ask you, Lord, to show us the way. Give us the wisdom, the discernment we need. Give us, O oh Lord, the grace and the mercy so that we can do your will day by day. You present us with a day. You've given us this day, Lord. Tomorrow's not promised any of us. Yesterday's gone. So it's up to us what we do with it. We can show your love and your kindness no matter who we're around, Father, or what we're around. And we ask you 
to give us the strength and the wisdom to do that. And Lord, we ask you to bless us and help us get through our daily lives and the requirements we have of just surviving, taking care of our families, others, and the various things that we do. Lord, let us never forget where that breath comes from. It comes from your mercy, and we praise you for that. Forgive us of our sins, Father. We ask you, Lord, to touch this house touch this church. Let everybody know, God, it don't have to be with a steeple, pews, fancy carpet, Lord, or stained glass. We are the hands and the feet. And what counts is that we have to love one another, Lord, before we can go out and love people we don't even know. Lord, put your love and your light in us. Help us now, God, and bless each soul as we lead to do that. For it's in Jesus' sweet and holy name, and for our sakes I ask it. Amen. 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 All right, you're all standing, so let your neighbor know you're glad to have a church. Glad to see you here.
needed. Me. Our praise team is just about turned into a choir. We're going to need a bigger church just for the choir. That's a good problem to have. So it's good to see everybody today on this brisk winter morning. Uh, I think winter has finally got here, but spring will be back Thursday. <laughs> That's one thing about North Carolina. This morning, we're going to look at the turning point of Jesus' ministry. We're in Matthew chapter 16. Up until now, he had been preparing his disciples for what was to come, for his upcoming suffering and death, but he wasn't really talking to them about that. He was just preparing them, uh, and now he's, he's been preparing them for the continue his work on earth. But from this point in Matthew 16, he's going to openly talk about his crucifixion and, 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 and how they're, that what's going to have to happen in order for them to, to go on and be his disciples. And then they start making their way back to Jerusalem. And we're going, to get, we're going to divide these up into four different sections. Section 1 starts in verses 1 through 4. It's called the conflict. The conflict. This is when Jesus was tempted by the enemy. This is not where he was tempted by the devil. This is where he was tempted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So in verse 1, it says, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him. By asking him to show a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret signs of the time. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus left them and then went away. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees here, they could, they could be best described in terms we know today as Democrats and Republicans. They are the religious equivalent to Congress. They, are, they made up the Sanhedrin. There were 70 men, and they made up all the laws for the Jews. And, of course, the high priest would be the tiebreaker uh, if there was ever a split. But they did not like each other. They did not have the same views. And they definitely did not want to work together. Seems like our government today. They didn't want to do that until it came to Jesus. And then they all came together. They all came together. And they came together this time to test him, asking him to show a sign from heaven. They wanted proof that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, it, it kind of... To me, it feels like Jesus is wondering out loud here where it says they can forecast the weather by the sky. But as religious leaders, they can't interpret spiritual realities. So he's asking them, they're asking him for a sign from heaven. And when they do that, they're discrediting his miracles. And everything else is done. And they're, because they say the miracles, that's a sign, uh, that's uh, considered signs upon the earth here. That's not something from heaven. Um, and that was their way of thinking. Well, what did they want? Did they want fire from heaven like Elijah did? Did they want bread from heaven like Moses? They could interpret the physical things and the earthly things. You know, the, the, the way they interpreted the weather through the sky, that's still a, it's like a sailor's, what's it called? It's red at night. Red and night, sailor's delight. Red and morning, sailor's warning. That's right. They're still using this same thing. But uh, never heard it. <laughs> it's our sailor here. Never heard it. <laughs> hey, he forgot. That's right. Oh, me. Uh, there's got to be a joke about Richard's surgery in there somewhere. <laughs> but they can interpret all these things. And then he calls them a wicked, adulterous generation. He refuses to give them the sign other than the sign of Jonah. Now, remember, Jonah was swallowed by the big fish. 
and he was in the belly of the well for three days, and then he appeared again as if he had died and raised up in order to save Israel from the Assyrians. See, this is, Jesus said, this is the only sign you're getting. He called them adulterous because they had forsaken their true God for an empty religion. He called them wicked because they were there tempting God. Signs will not convince a person who is determined not to believe. Remember that. Signs will not convince a person who has decided not to believe. So there we have the conflict. Next in chapter, in, in, in verses 5 through 12, is the confusion. Confusion. This is the unbelief of the disciples. Starting in verse 5. When they went across the lake, their disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves, and they said, It is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Do you remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them about the to guard against the yeast used in the bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The disciples were apparently more concerned about physical things like hunger than they were about the spiritual things. When I read this, I, I, it reminds me of my uncle. My uncle Gabe, he was in World War II. He saw a lot of action there. He fought against Rommel in, in, in Africa, and he helped liberate the Nazi death camps. But as a kid, when we'd ask him to tell us stories, he would tell us kid-friendly stories. And the one thing he always said was, I was more concerned about going hungry than I was getting killed. <laughs> That's the one thing he was worried about, because he loved to eat. He was about 6'4 and weighed about 110 pounds, but he loved to eat. <laughs> and he said the whole time he was over there fighting, he was worried about having to go hungry. But that's what the disciples sound like here. They're more concerned about the bread. And Jesus was trying to warn them about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but they were irritated among themselves because they forgot to bring the bread. When Jesus warned about the yeast, he was referring to not only their teachings, but also the example of rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. So they misunderstood Jesus thinking he was talking about the forgetting the bread. Now, Jesus rebukes them for not understanding and clarifies he's not talking about physical bread. He is talking about spiritual matters. You see, Jesus had just created bread for 9,000 people. Jesus can whip up biggest for 9,000 quicker than Angie can. <laughs> but he was not talking about the biscuits there or the bread. He was talking about the influence that these religious leaders had on them. He was, and disciples, he said, disciples should be alert. You know, if you put... One cup full of yeast into five pounds of flour. You can never get it out. It's in there. And if you want to cook unleavened bread, you have to throw out the whole five pounds and start from scratch. A false teacher can enter a church undetected. He can enter a church undetected. But when it is found out, it's too late then. The damage has already been done. And Jesus has warned them that the, the, the leaven of hypocrisy is what corrupts the church. So we've seen the conflict and the confusion. Next, we see the confession, the confession where Peter confesses Christ in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, what do people say this, who do people say the Son of Man is? That's, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, 
And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now, Philippi, this is Syria, Philly right here, had the reputation of being a pagan city. They were a pagan city. And there was a lot of confusion, actually, about who Jesus really was. Now, although they did hold him in high esteem, you know, they ranked him right up there with the greatest of prophets and John the Baptist. But they still lacked the perception of who he really was. They thought maybe he was a great teacher. But they even compared him to John the Baptist, but even calling Jesus a prophet, calling Jesus a good man, call, even calling Jesus a great man is denying Christ. It's denying Christ. Anything less than the Son of God is denying him as Messiah. And then he asked the entire group. He's not just asking Peter here. It's what it seems like when you read through there. But he's asking the entire group, what about you? Who do you say I am? Well, see, the word there, you, comes from the Greek word. It's actually plural. So it's like he's saying, who do all of you think I am? And he's not just talking to Peter. But Peter, of course, he's the self-appointed spokesperson of the group. He says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. He acknowledges Jesus as the deliverer that was been promised throughout the Old Testament. And now that Peter has confessed Jesus, Jesus has something to say to Peter. First, he blessed Peter for was receiving the revelation from, from uh, the Father of who Jesus really is. And second, he declares Peter which is uh, Petros in the, in the Greek, it, he refers to Peter on this rock. And remember this rock is Petra in the Greek. On this rock I will build my church. The word rock refers to Peter in this context. And thirdly, Jesus promises Peter that he will serve as the foundation on which the church is built. This is the first time the word church has used in the four Gospels. Now, throughout history, there have been many different interpretations about this statement of Jesus that when he says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. One of them, some take Peter as the rock and use the text to, to justify the belief that Peter was the first pope. Peter in Greek means little stone. Petros means little stone. Rock or Petra indicates a massive rock formation. So Peter was just a little stone. He's a little stone on this massive, massive, massive uh, rock foundation. And then next, some take uh, the Christ confession of Peter uh, as the rock to see as the church is built on those who likewise confess that Christ is Lord. Christ the Son of the God. And, and, and it seems the best to take the truth that Peter recognized that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God's Son, and, and as the reality which serves the foundation for his church because Jesus is the Son of God and Satan can never prevail against those who are his own. Though Peter was the rock that Jesus built the church on, in Ephesians it tells us that Jesus was the cornerstone of that church. And then Jesus said the gates of Hades in verse 18. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Gates focuses attention on the fortification that they used to build around cities. They used to build these fortifications all around the cities. And it may be a metaphor for Satan's armies. It says the gates will not, uh, will not prevail against it. And Hades itself represents death in the Bible. It represents death in the scripture. But we are promised, we are promised that death, death cannot conquer the children of God. 
Death cannot conquer us. Jesus conquered death. The keys mentioned here is a metaphor for Peter's stewardship in the kingdom. You know, keys were symbolic in the Old Testament times as the, the chief steward's position. So Jesus is speaking of some big, significant role in the church age in the years to come. And with these keys, he tells Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, this applies to God's word to his people. Uh, over in chapter 18 and verse 18, uh, this verse is used as church discipline. This power that he's given, he's not just giving it to Peter, he's giving it to all of the disciples. And in Jesus' day, the Jews spoke of binding and loosing as a, when a rabbi would forbid something or he would permit something. The most accurate translation that I found was in, a, in William's translation of the New Testament where it says, whatsoever you forbid on earth must already be forbid in heaven. Whatsoever you permit on earth must be already permitted in heaven. So when you bind something here on earth, that's something that's already bound in heaven. If you, if you permit something here on earth, that's something that's already permitted in heaven. The, the church does not tell uh, heaven what to do. The church obeys what heaven commands us to do. It says, but then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This seems counterintuitive to everything we've ever learned in church about Jesus, who Jesus is. And everything we have learned about what we are supposed to do as Christians, we're supposed to go out and tell everybody who Jesus is. But he's telling his disciples there, do not tell anyone about this, that I'm the Messiah. And, and what he was doing, he wanted them to wait until they had proof. He wanted them to wait until he had proof. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, they all wanted proof. Now he's telling his disciples, wait until you have the proof that I am who I say I am. And that proof was a resurrected Savior. That proof was Jesus, uh, after being crucified, died, and came back to life in three days. That was his proof. His proof would be his resurrection. Had they announced that beforehand, he would not be able to teach his disciples because of the crowds he would draw. He was already drawing huge crowds because of his miracles and everything he'd done there. But if they all believed, if they all knew, if they all believed that Jesus was the Son of God, the coming Messiah, it would be like Woodstock. There'd be half a million people everywhere Jesus was. There'd be no way for him to get to his disciples to tell them what they need to do because he's getting ready to turn this ministry over to his disciples. But once they had proof, once they had proof that they had, he had defeated death, then he could not be denied. This would be the sign from heaven they wanted. But remember what I said earlier. Signs will not convince a person who is already determined not to believe. So we've seen the conflict, the confusion, and the confession. And now we see a correction. A correction. This is when Peter becomes a stumbling block. Peter, the one that Jesus is going to build his church on, has become a stumbling block. In verse, starting in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised alive. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life must lose it, but whoever loses his life will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain his whole world, yet forfeit, forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory according to his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you that some who are standing here will not taste death before they come, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now his message turns to the cross. Before he was focused, he was talking to the crowds, uh, and he was doing miracles and, and, and showing the crowds who he really was, but now he's, he's entirely focused on his disciples because he was going to leave this ministry in their hands. He now openly announces his coming death on the cross and his suffering and his resurrection and what they would mean, mean for the disciples. And Peter just had confessed that Jesus as the Christ, and now Jesus is telling him he came to be a crucified Messiah, a crucified and risen Messiah. Then Peter, as only Peter would do, starts to rebuke Jesus for saying such incredulous things. So Jesus quickly and he forcibly rebukes Peter for thinking like Satan. Remember, Satan tempted Jesus to try to keep him off the cross. And now Peter's doing the same thing. Peter's trying to keep Jesus off the cross. And for good reason. But he's just not seeing the big picture. And Jesus then warns his disciples that they too should be prepared to walk the same road he's walking. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But see, this cross, this cross does not symbolize suffering. Is symbolizing the, the decision to do the will of God no matter what the cost. When we deny our own selves, when we deny our own desires, when we choose God's will for our lives, then we take up our cross and then we walk the same road. Then we walk the same road and since we're following Christ, we have to be self-denial, and we have to be willing to suffer. In verse 25, it says, For whosoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. This verse says, Whoever finds their spiritual life, when you find your spiritual life, you'll lose your physical life. But if you lose your physical life, for the sake of Jesus, you will be finding, you will be finding your spiritual life, and that will be a, an eternal choice that you make. Verse 26, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? All the material possessions and the privileges of this world cannot compensate for spending an eternity in hell. There's nothing humanly that we could offer God to redeem ourselves. <coughs> eternal life must be fulfilled by God's free gift. But this eternal but this context reminds us that eternal life may cost us our physical life. And in verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Whatever choices we have made will be revealed when Jesus comes. He's going to come and he's going to judge us all according to how we live. Now, unlike his coming as a baby and, and living in humble circumstances, these times he's going to appear in his Father's glory. He's going to appear and he's going to, he's going to judge all humanity. Lastly, in verse 28, it says, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 
Uh, this verse, verse has been confusing throughout the years. There have been many explanations of it, uh, uh, including the resurrection, or the, maybe the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, or, or just the kingdom growth through the church. But my thoughts are, this, this verse, it says that some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. I believe that Jesus, when He takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain in the very next chapter, and then he is transfigured. There he discloses himself in all his glory. And I think that's what that means. That they will not taste death before he comes in his kingdom. But you know in the grand scheme of things. It really doesn't matter which of these explanations are right. Which ones are wrong. The main thing is one day. Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to come back to judge the living and the dead. Now however you choose to live your life. Will be brought before God on the judgment seat. And he will say. Either well done my good and faithful servant. Or depart from me. I never knew you. If you don't know which one of those you're going to hear. If you're unsure about your salvation. I'm going to open up this altar right now for just a a couple of minutes, if anyone would like to come up and pray, accept Christ. If everyone bow their heads, close their eyes. If you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, that you would wind up in heaven, I want you to make that decision right now. It seems like that would be something that's so hard to do that, that, that people can't even do it, but it's not. The hard thing was done on the cross. Jesus took the hard part. The Bible says all we have to do is believe. We have to believe and we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Once we accept Him, once we have turned away from our sin, once we believe that Jesus really is the Son of God, the Messiah, once we confess with His mouth that He is Lord, we will be saved. If you'd like to come up and pray, the altar's open. We're just going to keep it open for a couple of minutes. sing with us. All right, everybody, hearts clear this morning. Amen. Uh, we have a fundraiser idea sheet over here. If you have any ideas for what we can do as a, a fundraiser for our building fund, we got a sheet up there. It'll, it'll be up there for uh, forever or until we decide what we're going to do. <laughs> but I'd love to have some ideas. The, the, the council is batting around some ideas, but we need some fresh ideas as well. So if y'all have anything to, 
that you think of we could do to raise some funds, just write it down there. We'll take a look at it. Uh, we will worship with our tithes and offerings on the way out the door. The basket's out there. Um, let's see. What else do I need? I'm sure I forgot something. Um, Bible study, yeah. Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday night, I'm sorry. Thursday night, 7 o'clock at Aversboro Road Baptist Church. Eric's going to be finishing up Luke here in a couple next couple of weeks, and we'll start on uh, Matthew. Yeah, we'll start on Matthew after that. But you really need to come. Uh, this is a great time of fellowship. Uh, uh, Eric does a great job leading that study. First, first Tuesday in February, church supper will be at Captain Stanley's. That's another fun time, y'all. If you've never been, you need to come. Uh, let's sing us a song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a sanctuary we prepare God that you we ask God that you would prepare our hearts to be a sanctuary for a lost and dying world Lord Lord as we go out this week give us a boldness give us the strength give us the courage to tell someone about Jesus Lord you put so many people on our paths every week Father. help us to be bold Lord help us to uh, to, to give uh, share the word of Jesus it's in his name we pray Amen. Amen. We all love each other on the way out.